Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's event. I'm really pleased to welcome you to our virtual panel and talkback of the film Complicit, um, The Legacy of the St. Louis. Um, my name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. And on behalf of the Library and the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London, we are delighted to host tonight's event as part of our Holocaust and Genocide Partnership activities. The HGRP pri primary mission is to reframe public engagement, education, and heritage practice about the history and memory of the Holocaust and genocide. Our activities are partly funded by the Ernest Hecht Charitable Foundation, to whom we are extremely grateful. And I'll, pub I'll put some information in the chat um, to learn more about uh, the things that we've planned in the future. So we're delighted to host this talk back and panel discussion with the creator of the film Complicit, Robert Krakow, and four former child refugee passengers on the St. Louis, Judith Steele, Sonia Geismar, Eva Wiener, and John Schilling. Complicit is a fascinating blend of drama, survivor interviews, and actual footage retelling the story of the St. Louis. That uh, German luxury ocean liner that set sail from Hamburg, Germany to Havana, Cuba in the spring of 1939. The 19, 937 mostly Jewish passengers were attempting to escape Nazi persecution. They were turned away by the Cuban government and then thwarted by American and Canadian authorities. The captain was forced to return the ship and its passengers to Europe where more than 250 passengers perished in death camps. The Hollywood Reporter, in reviewing the film, observed that, quote, a shameful piece of World War II history is recounted firsthand and a critical history lesson laid bare by the filmmaker. So before I introduce our filmmaker, just a few notes of housekeeping. You will be kept on mute throughout the entire program, but please feel free to drop in the chat any kind of questions or comments that you have during the program, and we'll save some time at the end to hopefully get to as many of these as possible. We've also used automated captioning um, for anybody who needs it. You can toggle this on and off using the uh, button at the bottom of your screen, but please note that it is automated so it doesn't always uh, accurately reflect the words of the speaker. And finally, if you have any technical difficulties, please drop me a direct message um, or my colleague Leah and we'll try to help you uh, sort it out from, from over here. So now to introduce the filmmaker of Complicit. Robert Krakow is a graduate of Georgetown Law School and the author of two acclaimed plays, The False Witness and The Trial of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Both plays have been performed in theater venues throughout the United States. Krakow is the creator of the documentary film Complicit, which we're talking about tonight, and which won first prize at the Rhode Island International Film Festival for the festival's prestigious Ju Judaica category for films celebrating the Jewish experience. His foundation was responsible for bringing 14 surviving passengers from the refugee ship the St. Louis to the U.S. State Department in September 2012, where Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State William Burns welcomed the passengers on behalf of President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton. The ceremony included the first ever apology by the State Department for refusing to address the Jewish refugee crisis during the pre-war and wartime period. In 2018, the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered a formal apology in the House of Commons regarding the fate of the St. Louis passengers. So Robert, welcome, and we look forward to hearing more about this important film and project. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. It's a great honor for us to be here uh, and to have, um, to present to you, the audience, this very unique opportunity to hear from five of the surviving passengers from the refugee, sh the refugee ship St. Louis. And I would say particularly so because we have as the backdrop the uh, uh, Ukraine refugee crisis and other crises you know, around the world. Uh, the story of the St. Louis, as many of you know, was a, a very impactful event, which gave a carte blanche message to Hitler and his minions that the Jews were expendable. And this was a point that we made in the film. We made it, I made it as filmmakers, you heard it from the various testimonies of scholars, and you heard it as well from the passengers. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, offer this unique experience to the audience uh, to hear the inspirational stories of the surviving passengers. Um, and I want to start with uh, Gisela Feldman from coming to us from Manchester. And I want to ask her, <clears throat> The others I won't be asking, but her in particular, the recipient of the British Empire Medal 
And I'm asking that she in her comments, please let you all know what it felt like to be at Buckingham Palace and to receive this most distinguished honor. So Gisela, I turn the floor over to you. Well, obviously it was an honor. And you know why we received the medal for Holocaust education. That is why the, we received the medal. And obviously it was lovely to be there. We didn't see any of the royal family because of course a queen has given up doing quite a lot of things. But it was a lovely garden party, lovely food. Um, and uh, as I say, I enjoyed it, yes. Well, if you would then continue with your personal story. My personal story? Yes. You mean from the time I got finally got to England? Well, However you would like to say it, if you recall, if you re recall the ship and experience on the ship, I think our listeners would like to hear that. Well, I was a teenager and I think we didn't quite realize the seriousness of it all. You know, as youngsters, you sort of cope with things. But I remember my mother always sat in a corner, never took part in anything. And of course, when I look back, he'd had to leave my father behind because he'd been to port deported to Poland and his papers didn't arrive in time. He was on the next ship, which turned back when the captain heard that we weren't allowed to land. So she never saw her husband again. She had the responsibility of two teenage children, didn't know what she was going to do with them once we got to a country um, where we probably couldn't earn a living. Although my parents were quite far-sighted, they took me out of school at the age of 14 to learn a trade because they said, if you have a trade, you can always earn a living without being able to speak the language which in fact helped me in England too. But uh, as I say, we were very fortunate to get to England. And one of the reasons it helped is when we had to go to decide which country we wanted to go to when we got to Hamburg, my mother said, you learned English at school for four years, stand in line for the British immigration officer. Well, he was so amazed that I could have a conversation with him in English that he gave me his phone number and said, when you get to London, if you need any help, please phone me up. And he did try to help us get our luggage. He even tried to help with my father, but the war broke out and he couldn't do anything about it. Uh, well, the rest of my life is quite easy. I mean, I had to go straight into domestic service when I get to, came to England at the age of 14, because in those days there was no money from the government or anything. If you didn't earn a living, then you just starved and didn't sleep anywhere. So I had to go into domestic service. And then I became an au pair girl. If you don't know what that is, do you use au pair girls? girls said, come and look after your children and so on. And I had a job in a Jewish family which treated me very well. Uh, then the war broke out. And because I had a trade, I could do war work and I made soldiers uniforms having learned dressmaking. So that helped me there. I could get away from the um, housework and when, uh, go and live my mother again. But in those days, we were very conscious of the fact that we must not be a burden. And apart from having a job all day, in the evenings, we earned extra money. We painted the faces of toy soldiers. In those days, boys had liked to collect toy soldiers. We painted the faces. My mother worked in a pickle factory. She used to bring the onions home at night and we peeled them. So they went back to the factory the next day to earn extra money. So when we talk about young people now, when I tell them what, what we did to earn a living, they can't believe it because they expect so much more out of life. But eventually I got married, 
had three children, um, celebrate, and um, my husband worked. He came from Poland, actually, from Krakow. And we had our 50th wedding anniversary. Unfortunately, he died 10 days later. Uh, I, of course, having had no education, I was suddenly asked to teach German conversation because of such a shortage of teachers. And that led me to taking certain, certain courses. And I got a job. And the chutzpah of it is I taught English to foreign students. And eventually, I was told we now can only employ people with a degree. So they said, the students like you so much, the exam results are so good. You can take an open university degree. We have that where you can take a degree while you're working, but you take it on the internet and on the television and so on. And it took me five years and I got a degree at the age of 50. And uh, which gives me a pension, of course, having taught. And uh, so my life was quite satisfactory, apart from the fact that we lost so much family. Okay, Gisela, thank you very much. Uh, at this juncture, I would like to uh, ask uh, Eva Wiener to speak to the listeners. Uh, Eva, if I could turn it over to you. Thank you very much. My story is a little bit different because I was one of the youngest passengers. I was only 10 months old when my mother carried me aboard the ship. My parents were both immigrants to Berlin from Poland. They came to Poland with their families when they were young and settled in Berlin and lived quite comfortably until the Nazis came to power. My father's family established the largest kosher bakery in Berlin. And it was a very successful business. And all of his siblings, all eight children worked in the bakery and it, it flourished. But by the time my parents married, of course the Nuremberg laws were in effect and life in Germany in general was very difficult. By the time they married, my parents, my, my father's family had some of them already seen what was going on and were very dis disappointed in life. They left, uh, one brother and three sisters of my father left for Palestine in the mid thirties. And my mother, her brother left for Cuba, but she was left with her th two sisters, her three sisters in Berlin. By the time Kristallnacht came around Life in Germany and in Berlin in particular was a nightmare. They managed to stand on lines of all the consulates and embassies trying to get visas out of the country. My father had been shipped to the country of origin. He was shipped to Warsaw and shared a one bedroom apartment with 12, uh, 12 men. But his fright of course was the outcome of the lives of his wife and baby, that was me. My mother was able to get a visa to Siam and was able to then initiate my father's return from Poland to Germany so that we could leave. In the meantime, my uncle in Havana had also been able to get us a visa to Cuba. Therefore, my mother booked passage on the St. Louis my father returned and we set sail in May on the St. Louis. As you all know, the St. Louis was not permitted to enter Cuba, neither America or any other country, and we turned back to Antwerp, Belgium, where we were greeted on the dock by my father's sister, her husband and their baby, hoping that we would be able to stay in Germ in Belgium. My father, however, chose to go to England and we were grateful that we were allowed to be put on the list for England. And even though he knew no English, decided that England would be the best place for us and a very wise choice it was. We ended up living in London 
from 1939 to 1946, a year after the war. One, one month of that six year, seven years was spent in Manchester as well. Gisela, we might have known each other. However, I was still just a baby. One, as I said, one year, uh, one month spent in Manchester was also very difficult. And life in London, as you all know, was not easy. But after the war, we were able to come to America and we settled in Queens, New York, where my mother's sister had settled. One other sister settled in the Jersey Shore. That's how I met my husband and we moved to New Jersey and I've been living here ever since. My husband and I celebrated our 62nd anniversary and thank God we were able to finally come to America, which had been our ultimate goal since the beginning. I went on to get my own citizenship of America and the United States gave me the opportunity to not only be educated, but I repaid the gratefulness by becoming a budget analyst for the United States Government Department of Defense at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. When I came to work there, we initiated a Holocaust Remembrance Program and went until the fort closed and have been continuing to do this program every year since. I'm grateful to the United States for having allowed us finally to enter and having been given the opportunity to live in a free country. I'm grateful also for the apology presented by both the United States government and the Canadian government for having denied us entry many years ago, but then apologizing for this gravest error. That's basically my own personal story and hope many questions can be answered later. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. Eva's commentary points out what I hope you all saw in the biographical material sent out with the link, which was the extraordinary contributions that the passengers made uh, after having been rejected, returning in this case to the United States and also Great Britain uh, and, and leading lives of inspiration to uh, their friends and colleagues and through our presentations to people around the world. So thank you for that, uh, Eva. Uh, I would like now to introduce uh, another one of our heroes, our heroines in this case, uh, Sonia Geismar. Unmute, Sonia, unmute. Sorry. Between 1933 and 1938, over 400 laws were passed by federal, state, and local governments that restricted the economic, social, and political lives of Jews. Many scholars, scientists, authors, musicians, movie producers, attorneys, etc., emigrated once they were forbidden to practice their professions. Surprisingly, many Jews adjusted to the restrictions and dealt with fear and indignity in their daily lives. Small business owners, merchants, cattle dealers, etc., stayed in Germany, hoping that normal life would be restored. Kristallnacht dispelled that mistaken idea. Kristallnacht made it crystal clear that Jews could no longer live in Germany. Between November 9th to 10th, 1938, Jewish men above the age of 16 were arrested and sent to Dachau or Buchenwald. Synagogues were set on fire, tourism prayer books were destroyed. Jewish homes were invaded and people were terrorized. My family lived in Maj, a small town 
in the state of Baden in Southwest Germany. I was four years old, but I've never forgotten that night. Nazis barged into our house, throwing the contents of drawers to the floor, uh, contents of drawers to the floor, breaking dishes in crystal, and tearing the light green quilts. My most terrifying moment was seeing a torn photo, photo of my father. I cried bitterly. I thought that that seeing the torn fo photo meant that he had died. He was incarcerated in Dachau where he was beaten, starved and mistreated. And after six weeks, he was released on condition that he leave Germany. Our ultimate destination was the United States. However, didn't turn out that way initially. We purchased, uh, my parents purchased landing permits for $150 each and passage on the St. Louis was available. On May 13th, 1939, a group of mayors, that's my, my maiden name, my parents and I, my paternal grandfather and two great aunts boarded the, this luxurious ship where its brochure read, we travel securely and live in comfort. Every, everything one can wish for that makes life on board a pleasure is offered. I remember its gleaming floors, wide staircases, crystal chandeliers, large dining room, a swimming pool. I ate ananas, pineapple for the first time. And I also saw people of color for the first time. I asked my mother who they were and her response was, they are good people. They are not Nazi Nazis. After two weeks at sea, we anchored and we were prepared to disembark, but were not permitted. Tourist landing permits to Cuba were declared invalid because a new law had been passed, decree 937 equal to the number of passengers, distinguished between immigrants who required visas and tourists. And now the new authorization stated that the Cuban secretaries of labor and state had to approve of you, plus you had to uh, it, uh, uh, get a $500 bond per person. I remember standing on the deck and waving to relatives who had, uh, who were in, in Cuba already uh, in, in their little boats wa waving. Uh, the, when the Joint Distribution uh, Committee representative, uh, when the negotiations failed, we were ordered out of Cuban waters. And you know uh, that we were not admitted anywhere in the Western hemisphere. The uh, Captain Schroeder, Gustav Schroeder was a staunch anti-Nazi and he had instructed the crew on proper behavior. He removed Hitler's photo during religious services and promised and reassured us that he would not return us to Germany. He was willing to run the ship aground so that we could be rescued. The desperation of an anguish of passengers was keen. In order to prevent mass suicide, the captain created a suicide watch. My father was part of that group and uh, Captain Schroeder issued a, uh, wrote him a, a very thoughtful letter of gratitude. As one historian stated, the St. Louis is a vivid reminder of the dangers of nationalistic immigration laws. 
but also of the hope inspired by the deeds of a single person. And that would be Gustav Schroeder. We returned to Antwerp. He promised not to return us to Germany and he didn't. We were fortunate enough to be assigned to the UK and not to the continent. We were taken in by all seven of us as a group. Uh, by, uh, we lived in a, a boarding house run by Quakers by the name of Lee. And Mrs. Lee taught me my first English uh, nursery rhyme, Bob Bob Black Sheep. And I had to always have one sack for her. World War II started in September, September 1st and we were issued gas masks, masks. We had air raid shelters. However, the JDC, the joint, remained in contact with the refugees. And seven months later, being in England, we boarded a ship for the United States. The ship was accompanied by a convoy. We arrived here February 11, 1940. We moved to the Bronx where we lodged with a relative and had our meals with my father's sister. Eventually, we rented our own apartment through Hyas. My mother who had household, household help in Germany became a domestic worker for a short time until her English improved and was able to take an office job. My father's first job was as a night watchman. Then he became a fuller brush man. Uh, for those of you in England, I guess you don't know, I, don't, I assume you don't know, it was a man, a, a person who went from door to door selling products for maintaining a home, uh, uh, brushes, cleansers, mops, etc. cetera. Uh, he then started his own business as a personal shopper. Unfortunately, he passed away at the age of 52 and my mother continued his business. She was devoted to her family and strength of character and determination. She was the elegant matriarch of our family and lived to see five of her 10 great grandchildren. She was interviewed for the Steven Spielberg Oral History Project. She passed away at the age of 93. My husband is also a refugee and we are blessed with a wonderful family. Our daughter has three children and the family has made its home in Israel. My son and wife and two ch children live in New York City. I had a very satisfying career as a high school librarian and then as an adjunct college librarian. I owe my good fortune not only to my parents but also to the JDC that negotiated the agreement for the passengers and kept track of us in England and to HIAS that assisted us and other refugees in the United States. Both organizations are active today, helping to relocate refugees worldwide. Besides the impact of the St. Louis experience on its passengers and the loss of 254 passengers who perished in concentration and extermination camps, what is the, the significance of the St. Louis? Number one, it shows that refugees are at the mercy of restrictive immigration laws. For instance, there was a proposal that uh, Alaska, which was a territory of the United States at that time, would admit uh, refugees, but that was turned down. Also, the US Virgin Islands offered to take refugees, but since the refugee had to have a country to return to of a country of origin that was Germany, of course, that was not going to happen. On the positive side, there were upstanders, not bystanders. 
who made a difference to save the passengers. Captain Gustav Schroeder valued the lives of his passengers over his career and ship. Morris Troper of the JDC did not accept the failed negotiations with Cuba and convinced Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and the UK to accept the refugees. And the Quakers, especially Mr. and Mrs. Lee, who housed us while in the UK. Your educational website, The Holocaust Explained, the website for teachers to, to, use, this, to use that website is to be admired. We must reach out to young people that hatred of the other is learned and can be unlearned through education. Contact with the other. Establishing community organizations to make dialogue possible and to take positive action to become an upstander, not a bystander. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, now I would like to turn it over to uh, our good friend, passenger Judith Steele. I do want to hasten to say that Judith, Sonia, and Eva participated both in the State Department Apology Ceremony in 2012, and also the uh, Prime Minister Trudeau very moving apology in uh, December, uh, I guess it was November of 2018. Judith is, uh, was one of the, if not the youngest passenger on the ship. So Judith, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I don't want to correct you, but I was the second youngest. <laughs> Eva was the youngest. <laughs> but you have to give her that rec recognition. Okay. I was 14 months old when, I, when we uh, boarded at St. Louis. And it, I always say it was because of the voyage of the St. Louis that my parents did not make it through the war. Uh, unfortunately, they were one of the few uh, passengers that uh, were, were taken to Auschwitz. <clears throat> I, um, I wrote a book and it's in tribute to my parents. And I'd like to read to you part of it, if I may. Please. Dear Mom and Dad, it's difficult to imagine the anguish that you must have gone through after having to give me up on that evening in September in 1942, when you knew you were going to be taken on a trip to Auschwitz to an unknown fate the following day. I know now the strength you must have had when you took me to the Ose that night before and left me there to live. The horror of not knowing what was going to happen to Opa, to me, or for that matter, to you. I, as a little girl of four, couldn't imagine. And all I wanted was for you to come back to me. Life would have been so perfect for all of us. I understand how much you loved me and how much courage it took for you to give me up. Dad, I remember how you were distracting me for a second and letting go of my hands and leaving. It was in that split second that my life changed forever. And I waited in vain for you to return to me. And Maman Suzy was there for me and dried my tears. I never stopped waiting for you and mom and prayed every day for you to come back to me. I never recognized the emptiness that I had been feeling in my life without you, as well as the unexplained rage. This is why I'm finally writing this book. I believe that I am doing this to understand myself better as well as getting in touch with that part of me, which has been in pain and empty all my life. I used to ask myself, how did they go on the train? Did they have a seat? 
did they actually get to Auschwitz? I hope they didn't suffer. What were they saying? What were they thinking? Did they worry about me? Probably. What about the lineup? Who goes where? Did they stay together to the end? I hope so. Holding hands and lovingly gazing at each other. I asked myself, how come I lived and they did not? Writing this to you now, my beloved mom and dad, I understand a little more about myself. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your great wisdom, the wisdom to make sure that your message will carry on through me, my children, my four grandchildren, as well as future generations. To educate my children and grandchildren as all parents should do to make sure that the Holocaust will never happen again. God was there to see that I survived, to tell my own story of survival and impart my experiences for the sake of peace for all future generations. <clears throat> Everyone in the world should visit Poland and the camps to see firsthand what happened and to know that these atrocities actually happened. I truly feel that all parents, no matter what race, creed, or color, should educate their children about this horrible time in history. I love you forever, your Judith. So this is basically, uh, my story is basically um, very much like most of the others. I was born in Berlin. There were beatings of Jews and the infamous Kristallnacht, and this happened November 9th and 10th, 1938, when the Nazis vandalized Jewish homes and businesses, torched synagogues, and killed nearly 100 Jews. Some 30,000 Jewish men were arrested, including my father, and he was sent to concentration camp number seven, fresne sur sart in the Northwest part of France. After two weeks, he was informed that he would be released on the condition that he leaves Germany within eight weeks or he and his family would be arrested. After the war, the camp Fresnes-sur-Sart was destroyed and rebuilt into a famous resort or tourist attraction. And so I was 14 months old when my parents ma managed to get book a passage on the luxury ship, the SS St. Louis, on the way to Cuba. I'd like to finish off or close uh, with the way I closed on my book. And I'd like, and it goes like this. As I reflect on my life, all 83 years of it, I feel like it is like a big crossword puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle finally fitting into place. For so many years, there have been so many questions. Why am I here and why are they not? As my career started developing, I was given the answers. Destiny made it so for me to live to tell my story. As I stand in a classroom full of students, most of them non-Jewish, I see in their faces a dream of a better tomorrow. I feel impressed with the depth of some of their questions, how straightforward they are and how anxious they are to learn. What started for me as a singing career has become so much more. One of the students, a young man came up to me and asked me to speak at his church. 
His eyes showed great sincerity, and I immediately said yes. Others came up to me to thank me for sharing that part of my life and expressed that they were glad that I was alive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. I'd like to turn the floor over to John Schilling. Uh, John, please proceed with your, uh, your commentary. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I was one of the younger people on the ship. <clears throat> I was about three years old at the time. My grandparents, uh, we were actually not Berliners. We were, I was born in Prague, what's now the Czech Republic. And in those days, it was Czechoslovakia, which was, well, which, it was Moravia, Bohemia, and Slovakia, the three countries together. <clears throat> um, in, in the period between the two world wars, there were laws against discrimination. So the Jewish population there could do almost anything that they were capable of. And my grandfather being an entrepreneur had himself a big factory that manufactures um, greases and oils and shoe polish and, and so on. And he was doing very well. He was very well to do. When we were born, my mother didn't have to do anything. Uh, to take care of the kids. So you can really see just how life was for them. And when the Czech was, Slovakia was taken over by the Nazis, the, uh, <clears throat> apparently they paraded right past our window in the section of Prague where we lived. It, uh, my, my mother quickly hustled off my grandparents off to Switzerland because they always went to the um, to, to Switzerland about that time of year, and they were able to get them out there, out of there before they closed the borders. And um, then they got in touch with my grandfather's brother, who was living in the States in uh, Winter Park, which is in Florida. And uh, my grandfather was able to get a, uh, a visa quite quickly, so he was able to get in quite earlier before we could in order to, because of the, uh, uh, he had a lower um, a number, an immigration number than we did because they had some strict immigration laws in those days as from each country. We had sort of a high immigration number. So by the time we were able to get the visa and get the uh, um, exit permit from the, not, from the Gestapo, uh, we would have had to wait about at least a year or more in Europe in order to get um, out of, out of um, Czech Republic and which was not gonna be very good for us if we stayed around. So they were able to get a uh, ticket on the ship to St. Louis and you know what happened there. Um, so we, we came back, we were not able to get to England which would have been very nice. We were sent to Holland, to Hayplot. And we were there for a period of time, my father being a uh, soccer player and played on the Czech national team, organized a soccer team there among the people that were uh, you know, athletic enough and uh, they had a pretty good time there. But then my father noticed that they were starting to fortify some of the areas of the um, municipal building. So he asks uh, what was happening there and he got the answer, we expect a blitz. So fortunately we were able to get this ticket to get out of on the St. Louis and get this um, tourist pass. <clears throat> so uh, we got on it and, uh, uh, no, excuse me, this was after we came back from the uh, St. Louis, we were able to get the second pass. And we were able to get out on a, on a um, freighter. And apparently I had to sleep with a, and my brother or younger brother also had to sleep with their, um, how do you call it? There are their survival belts, you know, in order in case because the the, um, the English Channel was mine, and we were able to get to the um, uh, to Ecuador because what my father did, he sent one word to my uncle at the time when he discovered what was happening in Hayplot, one word, urgent. So he was able to get a visa to Ecuador, where we waited it out until 
um, we were able to get a visa to the States. Um, it uh, was somewhat difficult for my father because he, he was a dentist. Um, and they would accept his MD degree, but not his uh, dental. So he had to go back to school when we were in Florida. So for about almost a year and a half or two, almost two years, we didn't see him. So I went, to, I went back to school. So uh, it was uh, fortunate as my grandfather being what he was and always send mother, send um, money out of Czechoslovakia, which was not quite legal uh, to Switzerland. So we were able to finance quite a bit of our lives um, on the way to um, Ecuador and then finally to Orlando where we stayed until uh, we were able to get to New York. Um, essentially that was our, uh, my story. Uh, we were not, we were not living in such a um, bad way as, and we didn't have such uh, hard times as a lot of other people did in spite of the fact that we had some close escapes because all the people that were left in Hayplot, even those that were still, that were still survivors from the St. Louis, just about all of them died uh, from being taken out of Holland. So about three months after we left Holland, they bombed the hell out of Rotterdam. And if you go to Rotterdam now, you'll see a big statue in Rotterdam as, as I've seen myself since we were there of a big man with a big hole in his chest because the city was bombed in such a way that they couldn't rebuild. So here there was a city without a heart. And that's what this signified, this statue. I've since been back to Czech Republic. I still have some relatives there. We still keep in touch with them. It sort of helps me a little bit too in my language skills, which are getting sort of rusty these days, but uh, we still keep in touch. Uh, my father's cousin, who is uh, the one whose children and grandchildren we now keep in touch with. The, um, he, she was a uh, survivor, Holocaust survivor, as did my father's stepbrother, who he has since passed away, as did my, did my father. So we were fortunate to get out. My grandfather was there. And when I went to the hate to Prague, if you get there, go to the Pinka Synagogue. There's a wall in the Pinka Synagogue, which has the names of all the victims which were taken away from Prague. And my uncle's name was there. My father, my mother's brother. And uh, it sort of hit me when I saw that. And uh, it, uh, because my mother always spoke about him, we have pictures of him. That I felt as if I owned known him, but he lost not only his wife, but his child. And my father's stepbrother even, who I met personally, he lost all of his first family because his, his family that, that I met were a second wife that he married and he stayed in Germany as a physician. So we lost a hell of a lot of our family. I only had one cousin because of this. And uh, it, uh, it's always stayed with me. It's even with me right now as I'm speaking to you. So uh, all I can say is, Zeit gesund. Everyone go to this peace and bring good health. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I'll turn this over. Robert, there. Robert, I do want to say something. I obviously misunderstood. I thought you wanted a short synopsis I, I told you very little about my life because I thought you wanted a very short story. So I could have told you all the details that everybody else told you. But I'll tell you one more thing. I now have my daughter in America for 40 years, a, grand, to, to, a grandson, a granddaughter, and five great-grandchildren, all in America. So, and now I hardly ever see them. But also a question now came up about the captain. Did people remember him afterwards? Well, I've been invited with my sister to Hamburg because they wanted to have a sort of remembrance for him and opened a park in his name. And my sister and I were invited to take part in that commemoration. Wonderful. 
But as I say, I could have told you a lot about my story, but I thought you wanted a short synopsis. Well, we wanted to have time to uh, have the people ask the questions, which they're going to do right now. So, Christine, let me turn it over to you, and perhaps you can manage that. Happy to do so. Thank you so much to all of you for uh, telling your stories. And I know, unfortunately, in shortened form. Um, so I'm hoping that we can have a few questions that might be able to elaborate on some of the things that you've said. Um, I know an hour is ab absolutely not enough time to cover everything. Um, and, and there's so much to talk about. Um, but thank you very much for sharing what you did uh, with us. Um, I'm looking to see if we have questions and there's a lot of comments. A lot of people have said, thank you in the chat. I don't know if you can see those. Um, a lot of really nice comments. I did put a link to Judith's book in the chat because we had a question um, to you, Judith, about the title of your book. So I've put the link to your website in the chat. Um, there was a question from someone asking about um, to Gisela, um, if you had something to say that would be the most helpful to a Ukrainian refugee family that uh, the, the query, the questioner is asking, um, they're hosting a Ukrainian refugee family. Um, do you have uh, words of advice or something helpful to say? Maybe it could be maybe to any of you um, thinking about the contemporary um, challenges uh, for refugees today. It was a question for Gisela, but it could be to anyone, I think. Well, I have friends that have taken a, a family in, but of course, uh, there's much more sympathy for refugees than there were, was in our days in the 30s. Obviously, one should help as much as one can. I, I could make a comment, if uh, you may. Please do. Uh, my, uh, if you notice, the um, vice president's wife went to Ushorod. Believe it or not, that's my father's birthplace. When he was born, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so that's why he spoke Hungarian. And uh, then, of course, it shifted back and forth between Czech Republic and uh, Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So, you know, there's a joke. They say, I lived in three countries in my life and never moved out of town. But the hardest thing is to learn the language. Um, you notice none of us really have an accent because we learned the English when we were younger. If you're under the age of 12, my wife being an educator could well go to this. All my family was uh, um, spoke the other languages and I, of course I was able to live with that all my life. For them, it's the hardest thing for the, for the older, generational people, it's the hardest. The youngest, it's always the easiest. So very often the oldest have to depend on the youngest. And that's the hardest thing because my grandmother and my grandfather had the hardest time actually when they came over here. I lived it my life. I uh, understand what they, they had to go through. So it's the oldest person that are gonna have to be worked with the most among the refugees in my book to really be able to fit in it's, it's the hardest for them. That's my advice. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm looking to see if there are other questions. Um, I was wondering if, um, oh, there is another question from Neil, who's asking if there has been any recognition or apology been given or sought from Cuba. And maybe this is a place to ask Robert to sort of, maybe you can tell a little bit about the kind of plans for the film and the project um, that you've developed in terms of um, gaining political will towards apologies and sort of recognition of reform of immigration That's policy. Difficult. It's a difficult Thank question. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. Recently, I was interviewed by a PhD candidate from the University of Alberta, and she was doing her PhD on commemorative events, including apologies. And one of the questions she asked me was, did we ever try to get a, an apology from Cuba? Um, and yes, we actually did. We tried. Uh, the Cubans have a, a representative in Washington, DC. Not, as you can imagine, it's not formal, you know, it's not an ambassadorial level. It's a lower, I don't know how much lower level, but uh, 
it's at a lower level. And we contacted him uh, with the hope of inviting him to one of our events. And he was uh, inclined, but the, you know, the diplomatic channels for something like that would very, were very difficult. But I continued to pursue it. Uh, but uh, I can tell you, of course, I live in Florida and the Florida, Florida Cuban community would not be receptive or approving of anything that would make the Cuban government look good. There would be a lot of hostility towards an event like, the, you know, an event like we had at the State Department or um, in Canada. But things will change and we do believe we will be in a position to get that apology because it would be something that would allow Cuba, a new Cuba, entree into the, into the new world, if I may put it that way. So it's uh, on our calendar, uh, not tomorrow necessarily, but sometime in the future. And I think that that will be successful because I think that the younger generation in Cuba will ultimately be very receptive. Uh, you asked me about plans. It's a good time to announce that this week we're going to be discussing bringing our program to the Galicia Jewish Museum in Krakow, Poland, um, with the idea of featuring the Ukrainian refugee problem in, in that program. And I'll keep everyone up to date, uh, but it's something we're very excited about. And we hope we'll be collaborating with the uh, Royal Holloway and uh, the Wiener Library on this uh, opportunity for us. So uh, that's a little bit of our future plans. Can I make a comment? We were in Cuba um, on a person-to-person -person visitation before the before it really opened up over there, um, and it was interesting because we were able to see the different. Now, one of the places we were visited was a sort of a dance company, which, believe it or not, had taken over a previous synagogue, and on the synagogue entrance wall had a big painting and commemoration of the um, St. Louis. And the fact that the St. Louis passengers are not allowed to come in. So I, we spoke to some of the people that, the, because obviously this was not used as a synagogue, it was used as a, as a dance space and a rehearsal space for this group. And they said they were aware of it and that they did have some sympathies towards it. So it's not as if, the, uh, this East particular group of people who are maybe a little more sophisticated than some of the others who may come in, they were aware of what happened to us and the St. Louis because there it was on the wall of that particular synagogue. I wish I could remember the exact synagogue. I believe it was a Sephardic synagogue, but I'm not, I can't be 100% sure. But uh, I just wanted to add that to it because I remember, um, unfortunately, there were very few Americans at those, in those days. I even found a check. I should check um, 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 tourist group over there too. So I was having a big conversation, but that's another story. I just wanted to mention this. Thank you. They should have repaid us the visa money. <laughs> Pardon me? And the, and the uh, fare from the, on the bus, on the coach, um, I mean, on the ship. Uh -huh. We had to pay a return fare. Huh, yeah, that's right. You have to make yeah, to make a, a two-way <laughs> fair on the, onto the St. Louis. Christine, one of the questions I saw in the chat came from my nephew Jonathan, who's with us here, oh, uh, and man. he says, uh, "Would it, you know, uh, would Joe Biden and Jonathan always ask the most difficult questions? I might add <laughs> anything to kind of make me look uh, put me in a difficult position, and he did it again by inquiring." Would Joe Biden defend FDR today? And uh, I thought to myself, well, I don't, I don't really want to try and answer that. But uh, so thank you, Jonathan, for making it tough on us, me in particular. But it does bring to mind, the, you know, the, the contemporary questions of who will take, who will be sympathetic to refugees, who would take them in, which countries uh, would respond to these most pressing needs. Uh, it seems as if Poland uh, and other countries on the border 
uh, I, I'd like to think that, you know, did a good, did a wonderful job. And perhaps it's the, the background of the Holocaust, which has contributed to a much more passion, compassion. Would Joe Biden defend FDR today, uh, given kind of what we know? Uh, and I think it would be a difficult, it would be difficult to defend FDR on the issue of the St. Louis. I think there would be other things that uh, Biden would look at and FDR very favorably but on the story of the St. Louis. I don't think Biden would, uh, I don't think Biden would be his defense attorney now. So thank you. Okay, and there was another question actually about whether your plays are performed in the UK, Robert. Have they been staged in the UK? Or no, to? well, the two plays, well, in particular, we're doing the trial of Roosevelt for the Jewish Federation in Toledo, Ohio in November. Uh, we hope to bring it to the UK, uh, but only through the film only through the excerpt, the 20 minute excerpt of the play through the film, which has now been in about nine or 10 different countries, but not a live production in the UK. Although I wanna say in the, uh, in the production in Ohio, I have added Winston Churchill as a, as a witness for the prosecution in the trial of Roosevelt. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I think we are getting lots of notes of thank yous um, to all of you in on the panel. Um, and everybody is, of course, very moved and um, thanking you for sharing your story and taking the time uh, to, to participate in this event. Um, and I hope that if you haven't had a chance to see the film, um, please do contact us and we can send you the link if it didn't come through. Sometimes things get caught up in, in spam filters. So we do have a link to the film or if you'd like to watch it again, um, of course, please feel free, um, but do send us an email. I've popped a note in the chat, um, but we'll, have, we'll be happy to send the film um, to anybody who hasn't had a chance to see it yet. And it just remains for me to thank everybody for taking part in the panel. Um, thank you to each of you. And thank you to Robert for bringing all of us together through this wonderful film. And thank you to everyone who's participated tonight with your comments and your questions. Um, and we hope this is the beginning of a partnership and we will have more events together in the near future. So um, thank you to everybody. And this is a sort of silent applause. Unfortunately, you can't hear anyone clapping, but um, thank you again to each of you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also. <clears throat> thank you oh. for having us. Thank you, John. I will leave the this up for a few seconds so you can see the comments coming in um, in the chat. There's a lot of nice ones in there. So I won't close it too quickly. But thank you to everybody for coming and have a pleasant afternoon and a good evening um, to all. We're grateful for the opportunity to share our stories and hopefully they will continue to be shared in the future generations so that the Holocaust is never seen again. Well, at 99, I still give talks, so I feel quite bad. On Zoom mainly now, of course, because during the pandemic, we couldn't have it live. So I've been giving them on Zoom. Mm. Wonderful. And I was a speaker at Manchester Town Hall this year, and the mayor sent me a bunch of roses so that was something nice. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thank you for unmuting me. I have a quick question for Gisela. Where is this park in Hamburg? I lived in Hamburg oh, for many that. years. Sorry, Erica. Sorry. I, what I live. What yeah, was the question? Where's the park in Hamburg for Captain Schroeder? Because I used to live in Hamburg and was curious about it. Like, because I go back and visit. Do you, you know where in it? Bamberg. In, in Bamberg? Yeah. 